breaks over Egypt's Red Sea coast. This is the Ras Mohammed National Park, lying at the southernmost tip of the Sinai Peninsula, where the Red Sea divides into the gulfs of Suez and Aqaba. On land, this region is austerely beautiful, a seemingly barren desert that in reality supports a surprisingly diverse plant and animal community. Below the waves, though, there is an utter explosion of life for which the area is now world famous. Ras Mohammed is fringed by some of the richest coral reefs on the planet. The present shoreline of Ras Mohammed is relatively recent, but evidence of earlier reefs is apparent everywhere in the abundant fossil corals that make up much of the peninsula. The visitor center itself is built on fossil reefs, dating back 60,000 years. Now it's the living reefs just beneath the sea that attract people from all over the world. Even today, many people still think of corals as plants, a misconception carried on by reference to coral reefs as coral gardens. In reality, corals are animals, relatives of the jellyfish and sea anemones, a relationship that becomes clearer when the coral animal extends the ring of tentacles that surround its mouth. Corals can be divided into two main groups, the soft corals, and the hard corals. The soft corals are made up of polyps, individual coral animals, each having eight fringe tentacles. They can be stunningly coloured or relatively drab, as in this velvet leather coral. Soft corals do not form a hard outside skeleton, but it's the hard corals that are the reef builders, the very basis of the coral reef community. Each hard coral polyp lays down a limestone case in which the polyp lives. Some species are solitary, but many are colonial, and it's these corals that form the reefs. The ability of the coral polyp to lay down its skeleton relies on a partnership between the polyp and microscopic algae living within it. These algae use sunlight to photosynthesize, providing the coral animal with oxygen for respiration and energy to lay down its limestone case. It's ironic that the partnership between a simple animal and a single cell plant has formed the largest natural structures on this planet, visible from outer space and far exceeding in size anything that man has yet to build. The reefs laid down over many thousands of years form the basis of a complex and fascinating community or ecosystem, where the coral provides a home, protection, food, and a hunting ground for a bewildering variety of different creatures. What may look like feathers are actually the tentacles of a fan worm, sifting food from the sea. It reacts to danger instantly. Now you see it, now you don't. Some, such as this iridescent clam, literally live in the coral. Many are stunningly coloured or patterned, like these bannerfish and this emperor angelfish. And there's no need to ask how this Picasso fish got its name. Parrotfish too are well named. It was once thought they used their beak to feed on the coral itself. Now it's known that they scrape away at the algae that grows on the polyp. The fish are not the only brilliantly coloured denizens of the reef. This nudie branch, a sort of psychedelic submarine slug, may only be a few centimetres long, but there's no mistaking its pattern. Here saying, don't touch, I'm poisonous. This flat worm may well be sending the same message. While we've seen that bright colours and patterns can help identify the fish, things are complicated by the fact that male, female and young fish of any one species often differ. This male Anthias stands out amongst the smaller, less elaborately finned females. In these jacks, during courtship, the male and female each change colour. The male here in black. 
This snapper is a juvenile. As an adult, it will lose its bold pattern. For many smaller fish, the reef provides not only food, but also protection. These blue-green crummies disappear amongst the coral at the slightest hint of danger. Here they stick close to the reef as the jacks, for whom they could be dinner, cruise by. Some, like these glassfish, find safety in numbers. This variegated lizardfish relies on cryptic coloration for concealment. Some take their camouflage very seriously indeed. This is a scorpionfish. And this, the master, is the deadly stonefish. The electric ray is difficult enough to see in open water, but it also packs a punch. Two kidney-shaped organs, one behind each eye, produce an electric charge capable of stunning the small fish on which it preys. Even more dangerous, since once hidden beneath the sand, it becomes almost invisible. Its colorful relative, the blue-spotted stingray, is easier to find. Far from invisible is the massive but harmless manta ray and its cousin, the guitar shark. Other large fish are more predatory. This giant moray is more often found in caves or crevices in the coral and rarely ventures into the open. Barracudas can often be found off shark reef and out in the blue, there's always the chance of a shark. And if you're very lucky, a scalloped hammerhead. Predator and prey is only one of a myriad of relationships in the complex life of the reef. Other species work together. Here, a cleaner wrasse, identifying itself through its distinctive pale blue and black patterning, cleans its clients. The wrasse gets an easy meal, whilst the client gets a wash and brush up. Here, a pair of clownfish shelters amongst the poisonous arms of a bottle anemone. Protected by mucus from the anemone's sting, they benefit from its protection. Whilst the coral reefs dominate the shores of Ras Muhammad, they are not the only marine habitat. The shoreline provides a home for creatures such as this hermit crab. And these ghost crabs. The park also boasts a channel of mangrove trees, specially adapted to a salt water environment. The underwater forest created by their roots is a vital nursery for the young of many fish and invertebrates. Above water, the mangroves provide a haunt for some very special creatures. These two birds, one black and one white, are actually two color phases of one species, the western reef heron. And this green-backed heron is right at the northernmost limit of its African range. Here, a juvenile hunts down small crustaceans along the shore. Other birds are after bigger fry. The osprey breeds in the park. Armed with sharp talons and with the scales on the underside of its feet roughened to cope with slippery prey, the osprey patrols the reef in search of fish. This time, it's unlucky. Twice a year, in spring and autumn, these resident birds are joined by thousands of migrants heading to and from their more northerly breeding grounds. The larger birds, like these magnificent white storks, rely on rising currents of hot air over the land to maintain their height, channeling them along the coast. At Ras Mohammed, the sea crossing narrows across the Gulf of Suez, and birds such as the storks or these steppe buzzards stream through in their hundreds of thousands, 
once again highlighting the area's international significance. The smaller birds pass through on a broader front. During migration, every patch of bush or acacia grove can teem with birds, like these red back shrikes, the female on the left. Or like this stunning male masked shrike. Outside of migration times, the desert wildlife is harder to find. These animals have had to evolve strategies to allow them to inhabit a hostile environment. Few are active by day, this bosque's lizard being one. Most avoid the furnace-like heat of the day. Some creatures are so well camouflaged, it takes a very sharp eye to find them, even if they are there. These are fan-footed geckos, but you really have to wait until they move to be sure. Likewise with the sand viper. Literally tasting the air with its tongue, it seeks out its prey, pursuing it over the loose sand with a distinctive motion, known as sidewinding. One of the very few mammals that can be seen by day in the park is the handsome red fox. Like so many special natural areas, Ras Mohammed's glory is also its potential downfall. While some threats are natural, like this crown of thorn starfish feasting on the living reef, most threats are man-made. From pollution, to development. With Ras Mohammed now enjoying the status of a national park, many of these threats have been reduced. Shore dive sites have been minimized to prevent damage to the reef platform. Dive boats tied to fixed moorings, and rangers patrol at sea and on land to ensure the park rules are followed. In the desert, tracks and trails are clearly marked. As visitors to the park, you can all play a role in preserving its natural beauty. On land, stay on the trails. Take your rubbish with you, or leave it in the receptacles provided. Underwater, dive or snorkel responsibly. Avoid touching the coral or disturbing the marine life. The reward can be spectacular encounters, not just for yourself, for generations of visitors to come.